Sure, yeah. I mean, if there's any questions, feel free to interrupt me. Um, it, well, it's not an interruption. It's just part of uh, how things go. Um, I'll be talking about a lot of things today. I mean, I was, I was preparing for this, this set of slides, and I was trying to build sort of a coherent picture of what my group and I have been working on over the past uh, four years. And I came to the conclusion it's, it's quite a handful. Uh, and uh, since the rule of thumb is to use about one slide per minute, uh, <laughs> It's, it's packed in pretty densely. So if there's anything that is of particular interest to you, just let me know, and then I'll uh, spend some more time focusing on it. But otherwise, it's a smorgasbord of, of different things that we worked on. OK, so uh, I don't have to repeat these numbers for uh, people in this audience, but whenever I look at this graph, it uh, continues to astonish me that, uh, that about one-seventh of the whole of humanity uh, presently has a Facebook account. Uh, now, that doesn't necessarily mean that all of them are using them quite as actively as you and I are, but still, uh, th 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 uh, these are people that signed up and, uh, and have an account on uh, um, a service that just six or seven years ago was largely unknown and where you'd have to uh, make a pretty good argument for people to use it at all or for whether it should exist or not. Same for Twitter. Uh, about half a billion people, YouTube, 800 million people. I mean, if these numbers are correct, those are absolutely staggering numbers. And uh, I know that Kati knows this diagram very well. Uh, this is uh, done by Joël de Ronet, uh, where he talks about sort of macroscopes. You know, we use telescopes to, 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 you know, to look at the, in, in, uh, the infinitely great. This is not true, it's not infinite, but it's, very, it's, it's definitely great. Uh, we use microscopes to look at the inf uh, infinitely small. That is also not true. It's hyperbole. It, it's just really small. And what we have uh, nowadays, uh, due to the uh, um, uh, information that social media is generating, is that finally this whole dream of having a microscope where we can look at the, uh, the very complex, not the inf uh, infinitely complex. Again, that's, that's just hyperbole. Uh, but we can look at the very uh, complex and, and study it in, in the amount of detail that is, that is required to build feasible models of the uh, very complex interactions that we find in, uh, in societies, in nature, uh, uh, etc. cetera. Um, the, if you look at the amount of data generated by social media at this po point in time, it, 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 it's not just generating information about uh, how people relate to each other, but also, I, I don't know why my voice is suddenly much more amplified than, used to, than it was five seconds ago. Uh, but it provides some really detailed information about the relationships that people have. So that these are sort of the interpersonal relationships. But increasingly, and I'll, I'll dwell on this a little bit, it provides information on the uh, on sort of uh, on uh, introspective uh, data that pertains to the uh, subjective states of the individual. And I think that that kind of information could potentially uh, uh, grow at a much faster rate than the social information that's been being generated by these environments and might potentially also be uh, uh, increasingly interesting for people interested in what's referred to as computational social science, namely a branch of social science that attempts to study social phenomena not uh, by uh, the use of what, what a colleague of mine called little data, I mean, uh, and uh, that was not at this. <laughs> He's actually pretty serious about uh, well-controlled experiments in psychology having tremendous value. Um, versus uh, computational approaches that, that are applied to very large-scale data that might be uh, quite noisy, but nevertheless uh, uh, quite informative in terms of its scale. Um, you know, I've got a, a bunch of graphs here that, that, that just to give you an idea of the, uh, of the amazing scale that the social media environments have achieved. Uh, the, these are some, some maps of the US and, and Europe that are based on no more than uh, 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 geolocated uh, tweets uh, on the uh, top left, you see in blue, you've got uh, uh, tweets being posted. In red, uh, it's uh, essentially Flickr uh, being posted. There's actually density maps of the number of tweets per surface area that follow the contours of most uh, countries and cities quite well. You can see that my, uh, uh, my home country of, uh, of Belgium and, uh, and forms one big megalopolis along with uh, Holland and the uh, Ruhrgebiet. Um, uh, then, there, then there's Paris and London, right? Uh, anyway, these maps give you sort of a very, uh, sort of a, a very uh, 
uh, a visceral idea of the scale of the, these environments and the kind of data that can be gleaned from them. Uh, I was also really impressed by uh, some of my colleagues have done sort of a language analysis of, of uh, a bunch of European countries. And you can see, for example, how Dutch is prevalent in Holland in the northern part of Belgium. And then it's, it's just French all the way down to uh, Spain. Um, again, these, these kind of environments provide information not just on the, uh, the social relationships between people, but who they are, what languages they speak, where they're at, what it is that they're talking about. And as an example of the latter, uh, you can see that some really important scientific research questions can be answered with this data. It's a map of the ratio between people mentioning beer or church. And you can see that in Indiana, we've got a, a beautiful mix of people having nearly equal interest in, in both of these topics. And I think that's, uh, that's a really encouraging sign. Um, the, there's also some more serious applications where people look at diseases, for example. Here's a, uh, this is a, uh, healthmap.org that uh, detected a, uh, a surge in uh, HIV uh, infections in Indiana. It's been in the news recently, and it's clearly visible in these maps. And this is essentially gleaned from uh, social media data, geolocated social media data. People reporting. Then there's also, of course, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, let's call them the Vespignani team has been doing some great work in, uh, in flu modeling and uh, uh, using epidemiological models to some degree also applied to social media uh, to model how uh, flu infection can, can spread across the uh, across the globe. But what, what my interest uh, in in all of this uh, is the the notion of uh, collective mood states. And the reason why I'm very interested in collective mood states is because I think emotions are tremendously uh, interesting, one, and tr uh, tremendously important. Um, I, it, most people really overestimate the degree to which their decisions are shaped by rational thought uh, versus uh, rather visceral and, and automated assessments of, uh, of conditions. And um, what that leads to is an environment in which we we tend to think of large collections of people as being ruled by relatively uh, sort of bounded rationality consider considerations, but where emotions actually, uh, visceral emotions play a, a, a significant role. And so my team and I that, that, uh, have, been, have focused over the past four or five years in, in attempting to extract um, indicators of, uh, of, of collective emotions from uh, social media. By the way, that's an animated gif of, uh, of Morrissey being very sad in the desert. Uh, he's, uh, he's touching rocks to express his sadness. And uh, uh, anyway, I just wanted to play. It's just something I worked into my slides because I, I think it's a really funny uh, video. But it was Epictetus uh, that said that men I, I'm sure that, that applies to the whole of humanity, not just men, are disturbed not by things but by the principles and notions which they form concerning things. And I think that's, that's really important now, now that social media is being used quite a bit to predict uh, or allow to forecast uh, socioeconomic phenomena on the, uh, on the basis of, of, of what, it literally, uh, what is literally being discussed. I think that what really drives uh, human behavior is, is not the events that happen or the things that they talk about, but the uh, principles and notions which they form concerning things, which to some degree could be construed as uh, emotions. So social mood, uh, we've seen has been involved in uh, sort of pub public health matters, uh, social unrest, uh, 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 economic issues like uh, 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 economic growth, market behavior, etc. But you know, how, how can you determine how people feel? And that's where uh, we've been building our microscopes. Um, those uh, those microscopes, uh, I've got uh, I've summed them up here. It's network science, very large scale social media data that we've been relying on, sort of Twitter, Facebook feeds, etc. Natural language processing, because a lot, a lot of that material is indeed uh, uh, text based. It's represented in text. That is not entirely the case anymore. A lot of uh, th that used to be the case, but increasingly we're seeing video. Uh, images, etc., being posted, and of course that really ups the ante for the kind of algorithms that we can uh, that we can construct to analyze uh, those kind of images. But uh, I've got colleagues that are effectively working on on deriving uh, mood and sentiment signals from images. Um, but most of what we did is really based on on text. So in this talk, I'll, I'll talk about a number of things: our uh, uh, investigations of how social mood, as gleaned from social media feeds, can be used to predict uh, economic trends and perform uh, 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 stock market prediction. Of course, that's a controversial topic. And again, the question is, when are you really predicting anything? You're doing it on the basis of, uh, of post hoc data. 
uh, but, but still for, for convenience sake, let's call it uh, prediction or forecasting. Then some, some deeper explorations of what public mood really means and, and how we can strew it, how we can uh, look at how uh, social factors play into the development of social mood, uh, uh, such as assortativity and contagion. And then some, some recent work that I've been engaged in with uh, my colleagues here at IU, uh, where we've been studying the, notions, uh, the notion of eigenmoods, which is essentially a, a method of analyzing social moods in terms not of uh, how, um, uh, by eliminating the parts, rather, uh, that are essentially given by, uh, by language and focusing on the parts of, of social moods or public mood states that are uh, really driven by uh, sort of uh, crowd endogenous uh, factors. And then some really interesting preliminary results I'll discuss that relate to individual mood. Uh, where we performed the longitudinal analysis of uh, social media data and use that to uh, derive indicators of, uh, of, of mental uh, health. Now, in terms of the sentiment analysis tool, mo most of the crowd here is, is so familiar with this that I'm even embarrassed to, to, to bring it up, but, but if you would humor me for just a second. There's, um, over the past decade, we've seen sort of sentiment analysis proper really crystallize in our community. Right now, there, there's so many off-the-shelf tools that perform, you know, Okay, not great, but, but barely good enough. Uh, I think there's essentially two types of approaches that people have used, and we, we've relied on that as well. There's the lexicons, uh, such as the effective norms for English words that people have been using. There's a fin uh, opinion finder, which has been an off-the-shelf tool. It's been around for quite a while. The Senti WordNet, which is sort of a, a markup of the uh, WordNet database. And there's a variety of machine learning approaches, very often ad hoc, because they, they rely on, you have to rely on the proper uh, training and test sets, uh, very often naive Bayesian classifiers have been shown to work quite well, support vector machines, et cetera. Uh, there's actually um, uh, mo uh, modules out there, in particular the Stanford Core NLP uh, sentiment library that actually uses a grammatical parsing that actually diagrams the sentence and then propagates mood values or sentiment values up that tree to take into account negation uh, and the role of, uh, of sub-sentences, et cetera, in determining an overall mood state for that sentence. And I g gave an example here. I, I, I don't think I'm, 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 I'm misrepresenting this when I'm saying that most of the uh, sentiment analysis tools that I've seen essentially rely on a lexicon approach where you're attempting to match as many words in a tweet or in a piece of text to a lexicon as you can, uh, as you can, uh, as you can manage, and you add up the arousal, valence, and dominance values that are given by the lexicon to determine some kind of a, a a sentiment distribution over that, that piece of text. And that's essentially the approach that we've uh, followed in a, in a lot of our uh, attempts as well. Here, here's sort of a list of people that have been using the lexicon approach to good effect. And uh, as you can see, uh, this is from the uh, DOT 2011 paper in, um, in Pillars 1. As you can see, essentially end up with some, some kind of a, a temporal uh, uh, view of uh, sentiment or mood as it's manifested across very large-scale Twitter feeds with spikes around Christmas and New Year when people are uh, clearly elated and then uh, possibly dips around uh, you know, early spring when uh, it, it just won't stop snowing. Uh, there's, there's other examples here that, that I think, that, that again, 2011, that's when a lot of this stuff came in to start to become uh, uh, well-developed. Uh, you've got sort of the pulse of a nation where you look at uh, different states in the United States. You take all of the tweets over time that have been posted from uh, people located in those tweets. You use a lexicon or some other sentiment analysis tool to rate every single tweet in terms of its sentiment value. You aggregate these values for every single state in the union, and, uh, and you create some kind of a representation of how the mood state across the nation fluctuates over time. Uh, in this case, I think it was de demonstrated that as the, as the sun rises in the... Uh, 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 rises on the East Coast, people start to perk up, and, uh, and then as the day progresses, they get really tired of working, and they become really uh, 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 irritated. And then, of course, the, the, you know, the, uh, the people on the West Coast, which seem to be a very happy lot, uh, get excited, and, um, with, uh, and that's manifested in this data as well. So in, in our own work, and most of you might have already seen this paper, um, but what we, what we worked on specifically is analyzing uh, uh, collective mood states along uh, using a multidimensional model that we developed. The, uh, 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 it's essentially based on the profile of mood states uh, data. The six dimensions that we measure in this case are calm, alert, sure, vital, uh, kind, and happy. Uh, they say that markets are driven by fear and greed 
So essentially, that's what being, uh, to some degree, it's being measured here. Uh, we've got uh, uh, kind, which is a measure of uh, sort of a, a, an inverted measure of hostility, and you have uh, calm, with essentially how relaxed uh, people are. And what we what we were able to show quite a few years ago is that when you take a, a, a couple of years of Twitter data, and you run that Twitter data across a sentiment analysis tool like this, that the, those fluctuations seem to line up quite well with uh, uh, future uh, market returns. Um, uh, perhaps I shouldn't go into the methodology too much. We essentially tested this via a, a, a quite a, a number of techniques, one of them being a Granger causality analysis, which is sort of like a lagged uh, cross-correlation uh, uh, analysis across the data, as well as a, a, a self-organizing fuzzy neural network, which we trained using the past three days of market data, and then plus or minus the mood data that we collected, where we showed, where we showed a, a significant increase in prediction accuracy when social mood was actually included in these um, uh, in the uh, in the uh, prediction algorithm, um, that result created quite a uh, quite a brouhaha because a lot of people in the financial industry fundamentally believe that the markets cannot be predicted, and uh, they, they might be right, uh, perhaps not from financial data itself, which means that quantitative analytics uh, might not be as successful as as, as it. Uh, uh, as a lot of people would like it to be, but my argument is that this is essentially sort of a, another dimension of data. This is not financial data, so you don't have in-sample data trying to predict financial data. You have an alternate signal derived from, from social media, and in particular, uh, a signal that, is, uh, that can be biased towards measuring the uh, sentiment of uh, uh, investors in, in particular, because a lot of people interested in investing, or at least that are tracking financial news, et cetera, are on social media. Um, Weena, my uh, uh, PhD student, she's now at the uh, Oak Ridge uh, National Laboratory, has done some fantastic work in uh, trying to unravel sort of these notions of public sentiment, investor sentiment, and, uh, and, and community sentiment by uh, essentially uh, relying on a, a number of uh, uh, surveys pretty large-scale surveys of investor sentiment, uh, such as the Michigan Consumer Conference Index, the official, un uh, un uh, official unemployment case, and, and, and I'm sorry, and investor intelligence, that's the blue, uh, the, the green line over here, which is essentially a survey of, of how investors, whether they're feeling bullish or bearish with respect to the market, and she was able to show that if you uh, cross-correlate that to uh, Google searches or a number of uh, uh, market negative terms, such as recession, depression, uh, unemployment, uh, unemployment benefits and so on, you have a, a significant uh, uh, predictive effect with respect to, for example, the U.S. Uh, unemployment rate. And in addition to that, if you rely on uh, Twitter investor sentiment, which can, which can be derived from a, 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 a similar notion where you're looking at market negative terms in Twitter feeds and looking at the frequency of those terms overall, you see that they actually lead investor sentiment and they lead the markets by a significant margin as well. Um, in, in later work, we actually leveraged that notion to construct, to automatically construct a lexicon. So instead of relying on a sentiment lexicon, the, we uh, constructed the lexicon based on whether the words in the lexicon were able to uh, correlate with contemporaneous uh, market returns. So in the case of China, we started with a set of seed words. And uh, I, I can't read the Mandarin, but uh, I'm, 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 I hope that the uh, translations are more or less accurate. And where we start with a number of uh, positive seed words that we uh, obtained from uh, about 920,000 news headlines. And where, for example, a word like profit, recover, I think the literal translation is limit up, but I think it's like an upper boundary. So it's a, uh, the, the Mandarin, uh, the, the Chinese character represents upper boundary. Are there any uh, Mandarin speakers here that probably, I mean, it's, it, it's too small anyway. But you start off with these words, you look at news headlines that mention these stocks. You measure the returns of those stocks on the day that those news headlines were posted in the morning, right? So you've got morning uh, news headlines in Chinese, and then you look at the, the return of those stocks over that day, so the contem contemporaneous returns, right? And then you uh, essentially do a cross-correlation between the mentions of those terms and the uh, market re returns that you've seen, contemporaneous market returns, and you start to fine-tune the lexicon to only retain the uh, terms that are in the top uh, the top percentiles or, or the, the lowest percentiles in terms of uh, leading uh, market returns. What we've been able to find is that you can, through sort of a a uh, cycle of optimizations of these uh, of this lexicon, you can arrive at a lexicon that, that actually is very good at uh, at, at predicting um, uh, contemporaneous 
market returns for a variety of stocks. And the nice thing about this is that it's nearly content free. This was done for Mandarin because we figured that was a nice challenge, but you could do it for English and about just any language. And you can do it automatically given that you have the news headlines or another source of information uh, such as Twitter feeds and, uh, uh, and financial da data to, to, to cross correlate it against. So I thought it was a really uh, a nice paper. Uh, Wien is actually f uh, uh, finishing this up. Uh, she presented this work at the European Central Bank uh, uh, about a year and a half ago, and I think they were, they were pretty uh, impressed with uh, the ability to do this because uh, bankers and people in the financial industry are not necessarily trained to look at big data and uh, large-scale social media data in, in this context, and especially when it's done in a, in a sort of a, a content-free manner like this, where you essentially have sort of a, a, a computational method that essentially generates sort of predictive lexicons, if you will, uh, without necessarily it being vetted by a financial expert or being informed by financial expertise. So I thought it was a really interesting uh, uh, result. Now, I, I can't claim that we're, we're the only ones who are having, have, having done uh, work on uh, market prediction using social media. Uh, I think Tobias Price and his group at uh, Warwick University have done some fantastic uh, research there as well, mostly using uh, Google Trends. So that's, that's where you're looking at search volume for financial terms, and you're uh, leveraging that to predict uh, market trends. One of, one, of the, um, one of their publications in Scientific Reports, for example, did something very similar to what we did. They looked at a whole bunch of uh, search terms and then devised a trading strategy that we use the frequency of those search terms over time to trade. Uh, to trade against the market, and then they, they, they purified the lexicon by removing terms that performed poorly and retaining terms that performed uh, very well in terms of the stra trading strategy that they supported, uh, leading to a continuous cycle of refinement of that lexicon. Um, I should also mention that we recently had a paper except in POS1. I don't know why they're sitting on the paper. I mean, we submitted it in August. It's, been, it's nearly been a year. Uh, but which I think is also a really interesting paper where we used uh, Google uh, uh, search volumes to predict uh, Chinese consumer confidence, which is also a really interesting leading indicator, and where we're able to show that, uh, that, that our results are probably a little more accurate than official Chinese consumer confidence index numbers, especially since that data, the official data, has been renormalized a couple of times, and uh, the Google search data seems to be much less sensitive to the, those kind of, uh, I wouldn't call it, uh, what should I, uh, what's the term, to those kind of, uh, uh, adjustments, official adjustments of the, uh, of the, of, of the numbers. Um, I'd happy to send you a copy of that paper. Okay, so uh, I don't know how much time I have left at this point, but uh, the, the, I wanted to talk about some recent... Okay, great. Okay, great. So I wanted to talk about a little bit of, of some uh, research that we've done in the past year, year and a half, studying sort of to, to, to a greater degree what it really means to talk about uh, collective mood state and collective sentiment. Um, most of the approaches I've seen and I, I'm sure it's true for you as, uh, as well, essentially rely on the measuring and averaging of individual mood states. So you have individuals online, you look at the, the content that they have posted, you perform a sentiment analysis of that content, you average it all up, and then you've got a collective mood state. Right? The problem with that is that uh, that's not really collective mood, it's just the sum of individual text sentiment. Right? The, 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 that's the sentiment of the text that, that people have individually posted on the average over a large community. It's not that interesting. For example, if you look at Christmas, Christmas seems to make a lot of people very sad and, and even more people very happy. And just by averaging this kind of data, you might conclude that people aren't so happy on Christmas. It simply means that they've, they've, they've got community-driven sentiment with respect to that particular uh, uh, event. Um, so what we've been trying to look at is whether we can sort of decompose collective mood in terms of the, the, the as an emergent phenomena, as sort of in terms of the endogenous uh, response uh, to social network phenomena. And in particular, we've made quite some progress in looking at sort of the, the, the variance and uncertainty related to measuring public mood and how it can be decomposed into the mood states of, uh, of individuals. This is, of course, a very active research area. I think there's a lot of, uh, I think this will yield some really interesting results. And uh, I just quickly want to discuss some of the work that we've done. The, uh, I'll skip this slide here, but uh, a couple of years ago, we looked at the role of Moffley in, in determining collective mood. And what we did there is that we took uh, uh, about 4 million user timelines, uh, 129 million tweets, which looks, which sounds like a lot, but that's about three days of the Twitter deca holes right now. <laughs> but back in the days, we thought it was huge. 
Um, and where we looked at these user timelines, and for every tweet posted by an individual user, we performed a very basic uh, subjective well-being analysis where we looked at the number of positive, negative versus uh, positive terms in that Twitter timeline so that every user could be classified as a positive or negative user. And then we looked at whether there was a correlation between the subjective well-being values of users that were connected by an edge, uh, reciprocal uh, following edge in the, in the Twitter graph that we had. Uh, the, the largest connected component of this graph is about 100,000 users for which this analysis was, was conducted, and the results are very clear. That there is actually a tremendous amount of mood sortativity on Twitter, meaning that happy users seem to cl cluster with happy users, and sad users seem to cluster with sad users. And you would expect the exact opposite uh, in this kind of data, because you know, when my friends are sad, I try to make them feel better. Uh, I, I don't try to, try to make them feel worse by telling them how things suck and how I feel bad as well. But apparently th there seems to be an effect where happy and, and sad users seem to cluster together quite nicely. Now, that doesn't tell you anything about contagion, though. You have to be careful. This is sort of a post hoc analysis, not an experimental analysis of uh, whether people are actually um, uh, influenced by the mood states of the people that they're connected to online. Uh, but I know there's, there's some really interesting work by Emilio is here right now, who's, who's been actually looking at uh, particularly sort of the, 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 the timing issues uh, of how sentiment or mood propagates through social networks. So let me look, uh, talk a little about some really cool recent work that we've been doing. I mean, I'm, telling, I'm telling you it's cool, but I think it's cool. You might disagree. Uh, where we've been studying the spectrum of, of, of mood states across uh, large communities to see whether we can uh, disentangle some of those uh, uh, community moods. And we've been looking at individual uh, longitudinal timelines analysis, which is applications to a variety of, uh, uh, of, of interesting phenomena, such as personal well-being and health. Uh, and uh, so here's the work that I've been doing with, uh, with Luis Rocha, uh, Ian Woods, Joan Sa, uh, Pedro Varela. So this is work that we've been finalizing. We're, uh, the, the, you know, we're, we're hoping to get this published uh, rather quickly. It's in its final uh, state. Where we kind of made the consideration that average sentiment across, for example, if you look at uh, social media, is essentially no more than just a language model. So those are the frequency of, of words as they, they, they would occur in a language. I mean, the is a very frequent word. Uh, happy is a very frequent word as well. And then you multiply that by the valence in uh, a given lexicon, you add up all of these numbers, and that's the expected sentiment or mood state on, on that particular day. Right? That would be that's what you would observe. And indeed, if you, if you would actually plot, sort of if you would bend the sentiment from, from low to high, and you'd plot it, plot it over time, so you've got like a vertical histogram here, and you plot it, you'd essentially have one big line in the middle that's sort of the expected sentiment on a given day. And that explains <clears throat> nearly uh, 95 to 99% of the, uh, of the mood variations that you will find on a particular day. So it's not very informative at all. So what we did is we, uh, we took these, these uh, mood bend times time matrices and, and used a single value decomposition uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, to decompose those matrices and then approximated them without the first single value, which we assumed to be the language model. And what remains, we hoped, would be sort of the, the eigenmood, if you can call it that, of the, the, the true fluctuations of mood that cannot be explained by the, uh, by the uh, prevailing uh, sentiment uh, and, and the prevailing use of, of, of words in, in, in a particular language. We've been correlating that to some really interesting social phenomena, like, uh, for example, on Christmas, it, it seems that people uh, perform much higher rates of, of sex searches than they do in other times of the year. I don't know why Christmas seems to be so strongly associated with sex, but our uh, eigenmoods seem to also be very good at predicting uh, why Christmas sticks out so much, uh, regardless of climate and, and particular culture, because we've been doing it for Muslim countries as well. Uh, the, the other thing that I quickly wanted to mention, the last minute at my disposal, thank you, Kati, she's looking at me, I, yes, Johan, I knew this would happen. Keep talking, okay, good. <laughs> you shouldn't have said that. Uh, okay, good. <laughs> Uh, so let's talk a little bit about, so, so, so the, these, these eigenmood explanations I think are really interesting because we're, we're sort of unraveling what collective mood really means and we're, 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 we've succeeded in eliminating the effects of, of default language, right? If, if, if Twitter's one big language gener generating machine and we're using it to measure uh, public sentiment, really what we're measuring is an aspect of the language that we use and we've seen some recent publications where people tend to prefer positive language. Right? Overall, we prefer positive words versus negative words, which will bias, significantly bias, um, uh, sort of an averaging 
uh, approach to measuring public sentiment from social media data. Uh, the one thing I've been, I've been working with Ingrid uh, uh, on for the past uh, uh, year, five or six months, yeah, uh, she's actually here. Uh, she brought her family, so I will recruit them into the IU community as well. Um, and so one of the things that we've been, it, it, it's, it's based on, a, on a, a paper that she published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences a while ago. And where they, they explored this idea of uh, critical transitions in, in mental health, in particular in depression. And if I'm misrepresenting, feel free to interrupt. But the idea is, is really that in complex systems in biology and physics and also in social sciences, right, um, there's, there's sort of different types of dynamics that you can see under the influence of environmental drivers. I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's cases where an environment, uh, environmental driver leads to smooth changes in uh, an observable, uh, the observable behavior of the system. There's, uh, there's definitely situations in which you have more sort of a, of a thresholding behavior where the, uh, the, the observable behavior of the system changes very rapidly when the env uh, environmental driver hits a, a particular state. But there's also cases where you have hysteresis, meaning that the system can drop into an alternate state very quickly that's difficult to get out of, and you need significant changes of the env environmental drivers to push the system back in another uh, stable equilibrium. And uh, what Inca and her team have done is to actually look at whether that could be applied to the transitions that uh, p uh, depressed people or non-depressed people can uh, uh, can undergo uh, in terms of their their mood states, and uh, the the most interesting thing that, that I think in all of this is not just that you can you can detect these kind of critical transitions, but you can actually look at early warning signals like increased autocorrelation and uh, increased variance um, leading up to the uh, to the point at which the system. Uh, undergoes the, uh, a particular critical transition. I, I don't have the time to go into all of this, and I think Ingrid could do a much better job. She'll speak about that in uh, a couple of weeks. I highly recommend that you uh, uh, um, you attend that talk, just because it's. I, I think it's just so interesting that you can model these systems and look at the uh, that, that you can actually detect these kind of early warning. Uh, signals for uh, a, a person's mood state undergoing a critical transition to an alternate state, which could be depressed or uh, healthy. And so what we've been trying to do, oh, oh, no, I got, just went back. So what we've been trying to do is actually characterize uh, depression a little better. I won't go into this diagram too much from social media feeds by looking at uh, the following. So this is done with Ali uh, Varamesh, again with Ingrid, and um, where Ali looked at People who tweeted something, uh, literally, I was diagnosed with depression today. People actually do that. They're not bragging. They're, they're probably looking for support, but they're telling you they went to the doctor and they got a diagnosis of, of clinical depression. Okay? So in this case, it was a, sort of a small uh, study. We found 42 depressed people in a couple of weeks of searches and about 73 non-depressed people. And then we used a naive Bayesian classifier to look at the part of speech features and the term features that were extracted from those timelines. And we were able to show uh, that you can actually achieve a very high degree of accuracy in, in, uh, in predicting uh, which user, merely on the basis of the words that they use and a part of speech tags associated with those words, uh, whether these users were in fact depressed or non-depressed. And there's actually a list here of terms uh, with very high information gain. You can see that oops and ugh and oh and et cetera seem to have a good uh, uh, information gain in predicting uh, whether a particular user is depressed or not. And so that led us to, 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 to um, uh, re-examine a data set of about 700 timelines for individual uh, Twitter users that we have. It runs from June 2010 to June 2013, so we have all of the tweets that these users posted over time. And leveraging the new lexicon that I used before, um, we've been able to uh, look not just at people who said, I was diagnosed with depression today, that's a, uh, that's a ground truth, but all of these users, in fact, and then use a, a system that, that, uh, that Ingrid and I developed, where uh, every single word that's emitted in, in, this, uh, in, the in the Twitter timeline of that individual is used to update a distribution of, um, a, a distribution of, of, of mood values over time. Of course, if there's very few words, then the, the distribution kind of uh, refers back to the, uh, to the prior. If we have a lot of words, we've got a high degree of accuracy in, uh, in assessing the, uh, the mood state of that particular individual over time. And here's a person that didn't say I was diagnosed with depression today. That's actually uh, wrong. It's a person who said I was diagnosed with bi bipolar disorder today. And you can clearly see how uh, this bipolar individual goes through sort of manic and, uh, and, and depressed phases in time. So we're hoping that we can do this for large groups of users and where we've been, been able not just to detect whether people 
uh, uh, are prone to suffer from a particular uh, mental health disorder, but where we might actually be able to detect the early warning signals of these kind of transitions before they occur, which could lead to very interesting uh, uh, interventions. I'm going to conclude now. I'm sorry, Stan, I did, did take up your time, but we'll, we'll duke it out afterwards. Um, you know, I, my personal thing, and sort of my conclusion here, is that I, th I think the growth of social data is likely to be more significant than ego-related data. That's sort of my feeling. I think it's sort of the, the era of social networks, we've all been very excited about social networks for the pi past five years, right? And it's really cool to know who likes whom and who's friends with whom. But I think the, the largest growth of data will be in sort of introspective ego-related data over the next couple of years, because a lot of us have already been on social media for the past six or seven years. It's been a long time, so you've got extensive timelines for these individuals. Um, we've seen, we're, we'll probably see an increased use of personal monitoring devices, measure blood flow, blood oxy, uh, oxygenation, uh, heart rate levels, et cetera. And so I think that, that, that will create tremendous opportunities in medicine, public health, uh, for, forecasting, and, and possible uh, possibly invent intervention strategies to prevent hysteresis. So if you can pre predict, if you can prevent uh, a psychotic episode or uh, a depressed episode, the, pub uh, the public health gains there could be much more significant than treating it after it has already occurred. And wh what, what I think in the future, in the near future, what we'll see is that people will increasingly start to look at those kind of individual features, that kind of egocentric data, and related to sort of network, uh, uh, network topology uh, overall where the, the preponderance of data will really be on the former rather than uh, on the latter. So I've got, I've got a, uh, a list of collaborators here, people I'm very grateful to uh, that have su supported this research and collaborated with me over the past couple of years. They, uh, they, they all have very interesting things to say about the, uh, the topics that I, I very briefly touched upon in this talk. And um, here's a list of publications that uh, I welcome you to, to have a look at and uh, give me some feedback. That's it. Thank you all.